G'day, my name's Tom, and today I want to talk to you about neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. Um, just to start off, I mean, there's an ever-expanding list, it seems. Um, they just keep discovering more and more these days, but um, we're just going to go through some of the major ones. Um, and as a, just a, an, a brief description, a neurotransmitter is something which acts directly, um, you know, through an inotrophic or metabotrophic receptor, postsynaptically, or it can be, as we've seen, presynaptically, uh, sort of as a negative feedback mechanism. It can also affect astrocytes and other things, um, which are a type of glial cell. But, um, but yeah, that, sorry, that's a bit of a side note. But, um, so yeah, neurotransmitters are acting directly, but neuromodulators, as we saw in part 10, are sort of you know, um, there's something that affects, say, the inotropic receptor um, or metabotropic, whatever receptor, and it's, you know, changing how the neurotransmitter can act postsynaptically. But really, uh, the, the, the distinction isn't very clear on a case-by-case -case basis. You can't say that one neurotransmitter is just a neurotransmitter and not also a, a neuromodulator. So... Yeah, there are lots of interactions because a neurotransmitter might be a neuromodulator for another neurotransmitter. So, you know, it's a pretty, you know, convoluted um, in that way. But, yeah, so it's important just to, to recognise that there, there isn't a clear distinction all the time. So, anyway, let's get on with it. Uh, let's talk about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is very prominent, um, probably one you'll hear about a lot if um if you are interested in neuroscience and 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 you know things like uh, uh muscles because um obviously in the peripheral nervous system uh acetylcholine acts at uh neuromuscular um junctions and uh, you know heaps of other places but that's just an example we'll talk about that in a later series perhaps and um it's also in the CNS, um, not neuromuscular junctions, but acetylcholine acts in the CNS in some places, but not. Yeah, it's not a particularly prominent um, neurotransmitter in the CNS. Um, in uh, it, we we make it by uh, choline and uh, acetyl CoA. Uh, but, interestingly, when it acts postsynaptically, as we talked about in part 10, it's broken down by something called acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme. Acetylcholine esterase. And that breaks it down, actually, into choline and acetate. So, yeah, not not the, co the acetyl-CoA. Um, and obviously it gets taken up by the presynaptic neuron eventually and you know can be converted back into a functional form into acetyl-choline. Um, but it's just interesting that it's not uh, acetyl-CoA and that's to do with the biochemistry of it, of this particular enzyme um, and its action. Um, uh, oh, and so... Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about sarin gas, or nerve gas, as you might have known it. Um, and basically that's an inhibitor of acetylcholine esterase. And if you think about it, um, if we inhibited acetylcholine esterase, so if we inhibited the breakdown of acetylcholine while it's on the receptors, we would get a situation where acetylcholine just is building up in the synapse and building up and building up and not ever getting taken away. Um, so we're going to get... Initially, we're going to get overstimulation at something like a neuromuscular junction, which is what you see in, in nerve gas um, or sarin gas um, poisoning. And uh, so eventually you get that overstimulation because you're getting built up, a build-up of acetylcholine. But um, you're also going to see eventually that these the acetylcholine receptors uh, become desensitized and you'll get paralysis because you know this is so much acetylcholine um, so you get you know you, you do de your down regulation or your desensitization 
of the receptors and actually there are two types of receptors there are nicotinic and muscarinic and that's to do with the sensitivities of those receptors to um, different types of um, artificially produced um, uh, agonists so it's um, but it, you know it's an important distinction because their their distributions uh, of these receptors are quite different and so you know, the the effects of different drugs can have you know effects in different parts of the body because of that distribution um, okay so oh and, and another thing um, so you know nerves which uh, produce acetylcholine will be called uh, cholinergic and we say any you know so if you look uh, this this bit here ergic is basically uh, it's a suffix where um, which is used for a lot of different neurons and it means you know the production of whatever the neurotransmitter it relates to before that so here here we're talking about uh, a neuron which produces uh, in this case acetylcholine um, so you might hear cholinergic or dopaminergic or whatever so um, all right I want to talk about um, biogenic amines this is a a class of uh, particular neurotransmitters um, there are a couple of types there are well there are the, the catecholamines catecholamines and these can actually this is a, a separate group uh, where we have uh, well we have dopamine and we have uh, noradrenaline and we have adrenaline. If you're in the States though, uh, which you might be, um, noradrenaline you, you'd probably um, be told is norepinephrine and adrenaline you'd, you'd call epinephrine but for most other places in the world we'd call it noradrenaline and adrenaline but that's just a cultural thing it's, it's neither here nor there. Um, and then uh, other than the catecholamines we also have uh, serotonin uh, but to talk first about the catecholamines as, as a whole the reason why they're grouped is because the synthesis oh, and, and all of these are, t are synthesized from an amino acid or the catecholamines and the serotonin um, but um, as we'll see over here the catecholamines are uh, produced actually um, in sort of a sequence and they're all produced by tyrosine which is here so you've got this structure here you don't have to worry too much about it but you can see here the first step is to, is to, is to make it into something called L-DOPA and that's just a, sort of a non-functional form you know step uh, in the process and that you can see just adds a little group here and then um, you know it goes to dopamine first and that changes this um, this group here and then we go to noradrenaline and we add uh, an oxygen and then here and we're changing this tail bit here in adrenaline so or ep epinephrine if, if you're in the states so you can see here that the, that's why these are related and that's why they um, I mean that the main reason I drew this for you is because I just want you to appreciate that we start with tyrosine in the case of all the catecholamines so um, and they all go through L-DOPA as well uh, an L-DOPA stage you know well that's a, a form and then it gets converted and these are all enzymes um, you know cr helping to convert to the next stage and depending on the presence of these enzymes depends on you know if the nerve is a neuron is going to be creating um, a particular you know one of these if it has the enzyme for this step but not these two then it will be producing dopamine but if it's got the enzymes for all of these steps then it might be producing adrenaline but um, 
doesn't mean that these aren't, uh, you know, it won't re uh, produce these as well. It'll produce these and then be converted into, you know, finally adrenaline um, most of the time. So, uh, but it could be rate limiting in some instances. Um, ser um, serotonin, on the other hand, so, you know, the catecholamines are all being produced by, uh, you know, tyrosine, which is an amino acid in the first instance. But, um, so, yeah, it's coming from tyrosine. But serotonin is coming from um, tryptophan. Uh, tryptophan. Um, and that's another amino acid. Um, serotonin is involved you know, in a lot of excitatory pathways for muscle control, but conversely it's in, involved in a lot of inhibitory pathways for sensation. So it's quite important and it has different roles. Um, yeah, so I mean obviously, you know, you can have these things where you convert something to an amino acid, uh, sorry, from an amino acid, but you can also actually start with an amino acid and actually have that as your neurotransmitter. So we have, if I break this up into the positives, you know, the, the uh, excitatory and the inhibitory, um, we have, well, we have uh, aspartate. That's one. Uh, we have uh, GABA over here. Actually, GABA is... Um, that, that's uh, it's a modified form of glutamate, which is an amino acid. Um, it's probably the most important inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it's used by many, many inhibitory interneurons, and it modulates uh, some of the most vital, you know, functions that keep us keep us going and modulating. Uh, yeah, it's, it's probably more strictly. Um, you know, in some cases, a neuromodulator, although it's you know a neurotransmitter in its own right. Uh, that's sort of where the you know the the blurry line exists for some of these. Um, but you know, it, it, it's very important in sleep, for example, and uh, really vital for guarding against seizures um, or you know the spreading of seizures throughout the brain. Um, so yeah, they're very important. Uh, look into those if you're interested. Uh, GABA. Uh, interneurons, um, which are, you know, sort of the major inhibitory interneurons in the brain. Uh, there are also glycine. Um, glycine, that's a neurotransmitter. Um, uh, mostly, I think, in the, in the brain stem and, yeah, in the brain stem and the spinal cord. Um, back over to the positives. Oh, well, glutamate. Actually, glutamate's another very interesting one if you're interested in looking into any of these. Glutamate, glutamate actually has two receptors. There's NMDA and then there's uh, AMPA. Yeah? Um, and actually, the combination of these receptors makes it um, very important for certain brain areas involved with learning and memory and uh, something called long-term potentiation, LTP, um, which, yeah, is very interesting. It's, it's something I'll, I'll probably make a video on later on, um, but it's to do with how these receptors um, can be up and down regulated and sort of the synaptic strength or, you know, spines of, of dendrites and things can get made, and it's very interesting, and I'll, I'll probably make a video on it a bit later on. Uh, but just know for the moment that glutamate is an important uh, excitatory amino acid, uh, which is a transmitter, a neurotransmitter. Um, I think also, I mean, we'll talk about neuropeptides. Um, sorry, this is going to be a bit of a long video, but there's a lot to go through. Um, neuropeptides, um, there are lots. Uh, but basically, neuropeptides, of course, are... Um, well, they're they're proteins, um, so they're one or more, oh, sorry, two or more uh, amino acids. Um, but because of that, um, they're actually they, they become expensive to produce 
Um, and uh, actually their precursors, interestingly, though, are more often larger than the actual active neuropeptide um, because then you can break it down by an enzyme uh, and then, of course, you know, you've got your active uh, neuropeptide, which you can have, you know, you can just have enzymes for in the, the um, exonal, uh, exon terminal, sorry. Um, but to reach the exon terminal, they've got to go via uh, exonal transport because, of course, protein synthesis happens in the soma. And, uh, yeah, you don't have, you know, your, your nucleus um, and, you know, all your ribosomes and things um, are not around in uh, you know all the way down in the axon terminal so yeah you've got to transport it by exonal transport it's quite costly um, to the cell uh, but a lot of important uh, you know neurotransmitters are made this way but I should say that um, not as many of them are released or made uh, as some of the other neurotransmitters because of how expensive it is um, but also because of how potent they are as well. Um, we have uh, the opioids. Yeah, the opioids are pretty much the major ones. And of course, they're, they're very important um, for pain sensation and analgesia or, you know, the absence of pain or pain relief. Um, yeah, so they're very important for, uh, you know, opioids as an example. Um, but they're very expensive to produce, as I said, and they've got to travel via uh, axonal transport, which I talked about in a previous video. Um, and just finally, there's some. There are a few others. Um, you know, just um, miscellaneous ones that hopefully I can remember. Um, well, there are some. Actually, very interestingly, there are gases, and you know what? These are actually you don't have receptors for them and you don't have you don't put them in uh, any kind of vesicles so yeah that is very strange isn't it but um, and also the synthesized sort of on demand so uh, yeah it's because you can't really control once you've synthesized it you can't really keep it there necessarily um, so yeah they're very interesting in that way um, because, yeah, because they don't have any of these things. And if you have a think about it, it's because they can just diffuse. They can just diffuse right out of the cell into the uh, synaptic cleft and then right into the target and have their action. So no receptors, no nothing. Um, for example, we have uh, uh, nitric oxide, um, uh, carbon monoxide. Um, I'm sure there are others, but... Uh, you can look those up if you're interested, and, and there, there are plenty more. There's ATP even, um, and uh, ad uh, adenosine. I don't know. Uh, yeah, ad and um, you know there are so many others, but we can't go through all of them. Um, but yeah, there are some very interesting ones. You know, gases, as an example, ATP, um, and of course we have the the neuropeptides, we have acetylcholine, uh, the amino acids we've talked about, and of course the um, biogenic amines, which are being produced, you know, from um, types of, of amino acids. But um, yeah, anyway, this has been part 11, uh, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks.